Hi, it's Mrs. Lynch, and today I'm going to be reading Chapter 7 of Pi by Sarah Weeks. So go ahead and get your book, turn to page 87, and let's begin. After Charlie left, Alice went and sat on the porch steps. Hugging her knees tightly to her chest, she closed her eyes as a wave of sadness washed over her. Nothing was right with the world anymore. Her Aunt Polly was gone, her mother was annoyed, and now Charlie was mad at her too. She shouldn't have said what she'd said to him, but what was she supposed to do? Lardo had been catnapped, she was sure of it, and nobody would even listen to her. Aunt Polly had always listened. Alice remembered a time years ago when her aunt had asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up. Alice had said that more than anything in the world, she wanted to be a squirrel. Most people would have laughed, but Polly didn't. Instead, she told Alice that she would make sure to leave plenty of walnuts out on the porch during the winter months so that Alice wouldn't have to dig around in the snow when she got hungry. Alice didn't even realize that she was crying until she felt a teardrop fall on her bare leg. With her eyes still closed, she began to sing. Who's going to leave me walnuts? Who's going to make me pie? Who's going to love me as I am? Why did you have to die? Ahem. Ahem. It took a minute for it to register that the sound Alice had heard was someone clearing his throat. Lifting her head, she was mortified to discover Charlie Erdling standing at the bottom of the steps, staring up at her. What are you doing here? Alice asked, swiping her hot tears with the back of her hand. I lost my shopping list, Charlie said. It must have fallen out of my pocket. Do you mind if I look around to see if I dropped it here? Go ahead, Alice said, too embarrassed to even look at him. It was bad enough that she'd been mean to him, but she could only imagine what he must think of her now that he heard her singing to herself about walnuts. Part of her wanted to exclaim, but most of her wanted to crawl under a rock and hide. Charlie quickly retraced his steps, but he didn't find the shopping list. Oh well, he said. Hopefully Miss Girk won't kill me if I can't remember everything. He started to leave, but Alice stopped him. She could almost feel her Aunt Polly's hand on the small of her back, pushing her to step forward and say what needed to be said. I'm sorry, Alice told Charlie, for the crummy things I said about your brain. I would, won't blame you if you decide to hate my guts forever. I don't hate your guts, said Charlie. I know I'm no genius, but I can't help the way that I am. There's nothing wrong with the way you are, Alice said. Aunt Polly was the smartest person I've ever known, and she always used to say, That Charlie Erdling has a good head on his shoulders. Yeah? Alice could tell that Charlie was pleased. And I was only teasing about Nora, she added. Who would want to have a stuck-up person like that for a girlfriend anyway, right? Right, said Charlie. I mean, good gravy. Just because she looks like Penny from Sky King doesn't mean I want to marry her or anything, you know? Alice felt a little twinge of something she couldn't quite identify. You really think Nora Nettleman looks like Penny? She asked. Yeah, said Charlie. But so would you if your hair was a little longer. Alice could have kissed him right then and there for saying that, except for the idea of kissing Charlie Erdling, or any other boy for that matter, made her want to throw up. Good luck with Miss Girk, she said. Thanks, said Charlie, and he got on his bike and rode off again toward the A&P. Only this time he turned around and waved before he sailed around the corner and out of sight. It was not long after this that Alice noticed the folded up piece of paper wedged between two boards of the porch step she had been sitting on. It was Charlie's shopping list. Alice unfolded it and began to read what he had written. One box band-aids. One can vegetable shortening. One bag sand. The handwriting was terrible and Charlie hadn't been kidding when he said that he wasn't very good at spelling. Alice started to refold the paper with, when the fourth and final item on the list caught her eye. One dozen canned sardines. Suddenly everything fell into place and Alice knew for sure that her hunch had been right. Charlie was just leaving the A&P when Alice arrived, breathless from having ridden her bike like the wind to catch up with him. What are you doing here? Charlie asked when he saw her. Alice was panting so hard she couldn't speak, so she handed Charlie the shopping list. Gee, he said, it sure was nice of you to come all this way to bring it to me. He unfolded the paper and ran his finger down the items on the list. Let me see. I remembered to get the band-aids, and I remembered to get the vegetable shortening. Drat. I forgot all about the sand. It's too late to go to the hardware store now. I'll have to do it tomorrow. What about the sardines? Alice asked, having finally caught her breath. Got them, said Charlie, holding up the paper bag of groceries. No, I mean, what about the sardines? She said. What about them? Charlie asked. 
Who do you know who likes sardines? Obviously, Miss Burke does, said Charlie. Otherwise, why would she want 12 cans of them? Good question, Alice said. And you know what I think? I think the reason Miss Gurk needs all those sardines is because she's the one who catnapped Lardo. Miss Gurk? said Charlie incredulously. The clues are all right there on the shopping list, Alice told him, and she began ticking things off on her fingers. She needs sand for his litter box, and the band-aids are for the scratches Lardo probably gave her when she snatched him. What about the vegetable shortening? asked Charlie. What's that supposed to be for? That's the most important clue of all, Alice told him. The reason she needs vegetable shortening is because she's making a pie. Charlie scratched his head. Why would Miss Gurk have to steal your auntie's cat if she wants to make a pie? Everybody and their uncle has been making pies around here lately, and none of them had to steal a cat to do it. It's not the cat she needs. It's the pie crust recipe. That's what she was looking for when she broke into the pie shop, but she didn't find it. So the next day, when the Ipsy News ran the story about Aunt Polly leaving the recipe to Lardo, she decided to catnap him. Wait a minute, back up, said Charlie. You think Miss Gurk was the one who broke into the pie shop? I don't think so. I know so, said Alice. I saw her steal the key. When? At the funeral. She reached into Aunt Polly's casket, and then she jerked her hand back out real quick. I didn't realize it at the time, but she must have taken the key. Don't get mad, said Charlie, but your mom said she saw the key. That's because she did see the key. It was there when she looked at Aunt Polly. But by the time I looked at her, Miss Gurk had already stolen it. Good gravy, said Charlie. Are you sure? Come on, Alice said. I'll prove it. Even though Charlie was not completely convinced, he allowed Alice to talk him into letting her follow him to Miss Gurk's house. On the way, her bicycle chain slipped off and the pedals began to spin around without catching hold. Charlie heard the clattering and circled back around to help. Watching him work with the greasy chain, Alice understood why his fingernails looked the way they did. Well, what if Miss Gert catches us snooping around? Charlie asked nervously. She might get really steamed. Don't worry, said Alice. She's not going to catch us. When they got to Miss Gert's house, they found her car parked in the driveway. It was clear from the dripping garden hose and the bucket of soapy water standing beside it that it had recently been washed. The big green car gleamed like a lizard basking in the sun. Charlie and Alice stashed their bikes in the bushes. Are you scared? asked Charlie. I mean, you've heard the stories, right? There were a lot of rumors that had been passed around school over the years about Miss Gurk and the reason she wore such loose-fitting clothes. One of the most popular stories was that she was hiding the mummified body of a kid who'd been tardy to school one too many times. Alice tried not to think about that as she dove headfirst into a bank of holly that ran along the front of Miss Gurk's house. A minute later, Charlie joined her. Next time, let's pick a bush without prickers, he whispered, wincing as he pulled off a spiky holly leaf that was stuck to one of his palms. What do we do now? Let's peek in the window. If we see any sign of Lardo, we'll go straight to the police, Alice whispered back. There was a big picture window in front in the front of Miss Gurk's house. Charlie and Alice crawled on their bellies, commando style, across the lawn until they were situated just beneath it. Ready? asked Alice. Charlie nodded, and slowly they rose up until their noses were resting on the sill. See anything? Alice whispered, peering through the glass into Miss Gurk's living room. Just some furniture, said Charlie. Thwack, thwack, thwack. Charlie and Alice froze. What was that? Charlie whispered. Thwack, thwack, thwack. The sound seemed to be coming from the backyard. Alice signaled Charlie to get down, and they crawled across the lawn and around the corner to the back of the house. Thwack, thwack, thwack. It was louder now, and in between the thwacks was another sound, like a little grunt. The backyard was surrounded by a wooden fence that was too high to see over. Charlie put one finger to his lips, warning Alice to be quiet. Then he squatted down and interlaced his fingers to make a little basket. Alice slipped her foot into his hands, and Charlie boosted her up. Thwack, grunt, thwack, grunt, thwack, grunt. What is it? Charlie called up to Alice. What do you see? There was only one word Alice could think of to describe the terrifying sight that lay on the other side of that fence, and her voice was shaking so badly she had trouble getting it out. Um, mmm, mmm, she stammered. Just then, Charlie heard a buzzing sound near his left ear. A giant horsefly was circling his head. Anyone who's ever been bitten by a horsefly knows that it's an experience worth avoiding if at all possible. But when Charlie felt the fly land on the back of his neck, he wasn't able to swat it because his hands were busy holding on to Alice's foot. 
When the fly bit him, Charlie yelped and jumped three feet in the air, letting go of Alice's foot with such force that it launched her over the fence like a missile straight into Miss Girk's backyard. What on earth? Miss Girk sputtered as Alice landed at her feet in a heap. Were you spying on me? It's hard to imagine many things more unsettling than seeing your principal without her clothes on. Not that Miss Girk was naked, thank goodness, but the bright red skin-tight outfit she was wearing that day was a far cry from the kind of clothing she normally wore. Even more shocking than the outfit itself was the fact that Alice now knew what Miss Girk had been hiding under her loose clothes. Muscles. Great big ones. Standing there in her skimpy red suit, Miss Girk didn't look like a principal at all. She looked like Charles Atlas, the beefy muscleman Alice had seen pictures of in magazine ads. From her bulging biceps to her rippling calves, Miss Girk's rock-hard body glistened in the sunlight like a glazed ham. No wonder she'd been able to tear the pie shop apart. She was huge. What do you have to say for yourself? demanded Miss Girk. <clears throat> Alice was speechless. She had come there to accuse Miss Girk of catnapping Lardo, but looking at those giant muscles, all she could think about was Aunt Polly's couch cushions with all the stuffing yanked out. Alice hoped she wasn't about to meet the same fate as those poor pillows. Well, said Miss Girk, let's have it. Ding dong. The doorbell chimed from inside the house, and Alice breathed, Alice breathed a huge sigh of relief. Whoever it was, Alice would explain everything to them. The police would come and take Miss Girk off to jail. Then Alice would bring Lardo home and spend the rest of her life trying to forget the horrifying sight of Miss Girk in that stretchy red outfit. Don't move, Miss Girk told Alice. Then she reached for her robe, which was hanging over the back of a chair, slipped it on, and went to answer the door. A minute later, Alice heard Charlie's voice coming from inside the house. Here you go, Miss Girk, he shouted. I got the groceries you asked for. Put the bag on the table over there, Miss Girk instructed, and there's no need to shout, young man. I'm not deaf. Charlie wasn't shouting for Miss Girk's benefit. He was trying to let Alice know that he hadn't abandoned her. After all, it was his fault she'd ended up on the wrong side of the fence. Is everything okay? Charlie shouted. Don't be shy. Speak right up. Alice wanted to run inside or call out to Charlie to get the police, but she was afraid it would make Miss Girk even madder. I don't know what's gotten into you today, Charles, said Miss Girk. You're certainly behaving strangely. May I just say that it is a very lovely robe you're wearing today, Miss Girk, Charlie shouted. The color really brings out the blue in your eyes, and the material is so, well, nubby. I think would be a good word to describe it, don't you? Alice couldn't imagine why Charlie was babbling on about Miss Girk's bathrobe until it dawned on her that he might be trying to distract Miss Girk to give Alice time to escape. Sky King himself would have been proud of that plan. Looking around for something to stand on, Alice spied a folding aluminum lawn chair and quickly dragged it over to the fence. But when she climbed up on it, her feet immediately slipped through the plastic webbing and the chair toppled over, taking Alice along with it and making a terrible clatter in the process. Did I mention that I forgot to bring the sand? Charlie asked, shouting even louder now, an attempt to try to cover up the racket Alice was making. What on earth is the matter with you? Miss Girk cried. Charlie was running out of ideas, so he decided it was time to come clean. I didn't mean to do it, Miss Girk he said. A horsefly bit my neck, and the next thing I knew, Alice was flying over your fence. Oh, said Miss Girk. So you and your little girlfriend were in cahoots. I don't know what cahoots means, and Alice is not my girlfriend, but I'm the one who threw her over the fence, so if you're going to turn one of us into a mummy, it ought to be me. Alice, who was still hopelessly tangled up in the chair, was beginning to panic. Nobody knew where she was, and clearly the police weren't on the way. Charlie had done his best, but now it was time for her to step up to the plate, so she did the only thing she could think of to do. She screamed. The minute Miss Girk heard Alice screaming, she raced for the door with Charlie at her heels. As they barreled out of the house into the backyard, visions of mummies and violated couch cushions flashed before Alice's eyes, and she screamed even louder. Miss Girk bounded down the steps, reaching for Alice with her massive arms, but the belt of her robe got caught in the door handle, yanking her backwards like a dog on a leash. When she tried to pull herself free, the robe fell open, revealing her gigantic muscles to Charlie for the first time. His eyes practically popped out of their sockets as he took in the sight of Miss Girk in her skimpy red suit. Then a strange sensation came over him, like somebody popped a fizzy into his head and carbonated his brain. Good gravy, Miss Girk, said Charlie. You look exactly like... But before he could finish his sentence, everything went black. Make sure you keep reading pie.